I don't do those things. That he will not see it. I cannot do it. Because it's all inside, it's not outside. It comes, it's, it's there, and when it comes out, it comes here on the finger, but not, not on the face. So you don't have, it's not, I'm not very interesting for you people. No. In playing, maybe in sound, I don't know. That's something different. It don't look my, my age, I'm 58 already, so don't, don't make me look 58, a little less. Look a day older than 57. Yeah, 57 is... Uh... In 1974, he was joking. He had a great sense of humor. He didn't think that he was the great pianist that he was. So he took himself uh, not, not seriously because he was a, a great artist. Philosophy was to transmit the music to the public and not boring the public. It was saying a concert is not a lecture. A concert you go for enjoyment. When I used to go to piano recitals before I met him, I was bored to death. When I heard him, I was exhilarated. I stayed 56 years with him, married. So it's almost a record. I met him at a party after somebody else's concert. And uh, he didn't like to talk very much with people. And the moment he saw a piano, he was sitting at the piano. So I started to sit at the piano. And then I heard him when he came to Milano that spring. And I was already been, I've been already fascinated, first by the piano playing, and then by the person. I cannot do better. Je dois te dire, quand tu finis un, un morceau, ne fais pas les grimaces. Non, pas parce qu'il brûle. Et ça, on ne peut pas l'enlever. Tu comprends? Fini. Fini, she said, don't make traces because it. Why do you have to say to everybody what I'm telling you? In a very good voice. It's very intimate now. Thank you. 
he said he was born in uh, Kiev. Now it seems that he was born in Berdice. They say Berdice because Berdice was a small town or village where there were mostly Jewish people. And I don't think that Mr. Hawes ever negated that he came from a Jewish family. He was not a snob. He was a straightforward person, except when he used his fantasy to tell the same story twice in a different way, you know. But I had to be quiet, but I knew that it was the same story with a different variation. What do you want? He was, he was an artist, no? The first teacher was his mother. I was six years old. I played piano because I, I saw my mother playing piano. I wanted to play like her. I was the youngest. My mother said that when I was three years old, I was playing on the window. And I broke the window. It was all in blood. And she said that he would play the piano or some instrument. Three years old. My father, my mother, me, and my sister, we four play. And my uncle was coming from Kharkiv. We call him uncle who play loud. Because <laughs> you know, he play loud. And I said, I want to play like him one day. When I was six and seven, you know. But when I was 10 and 11, I didn't want to play like anybody, only like myself. He said, you know, everybody loved me in the school because I was already the last of the class. I never studied, and when I was in, um, in school, I was thinking about music, so they loved me. They were calling me the crazy pianist in the school when I was small. Already. And being in the conservatory, I was a very talented pupil. So when I was final examination, and I played my final piece, and I played with such a eclat. Do you have words in English, eclat, you know? That the whole panel of the teachers, they all stood up. First time in the history of the conservatory. I played for Scabby one year before he died. He wanted to be nice to my uncle. And my uncle told him, I have a nephew who is so talented, you have to hear him. So I came here, he was sitting like that. Scabby, he was crazy, you know. And finally I played, it takes 10 minutes only. After that, he told my mother, I told you that. That he will be a pianist and very well, but you have to educate him. He should know the literature, the painting, the, 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 the everything outside of it, the whole music, the opera, orchestra, everything. Well, you stop.
stop, please. Oh, did you? That's all very popular, but it's not in the program. All along. I yeah. remember everything. This was a caricature taken in Russia. Don't you find it amusing? And it, the small one. And you see, he always sat very far from the piano. That when he was 17 or 18 in Russia. You see, he had long hair. Don't you think he looks like Chopin? When you were a young man, you had a, a fan club in Leningrad, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. S squealing girls, yeah. like like a rock star. I was like, uh, how you call it, movie star. <laughs> that time. Idol, yeah. mm. But not now anymore, no. Now it's finished. That was in your pocket the day you left Russia. I remember that. <laughs> Hold it in your hand. In my pocket was there. And the money was in the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Why was the money in your shoes? Because it, we, valuta was not allowed. I bought dollar and pound that time. Because I, I paid the, for the country in Berlin and Hamburg with the money I made in Russia. But you had to get the money out. Yeah. So I put it in the shoe because if they will fight, I will be in the prison. Don't tell that. <laughs> when, you, when you passed the last soldier with the money in your shoe, you must have been sweating a little. Sweating. I was white. I was frightened to death. But um, they were very nice to me. They said, don't forget your mother, Russia, and come back one day, too. left in 25 because it wanted to see the world and enlarge his view on music. And he said to himself, I'm paying for three concerts in Berlin. If I have success, I stay. If I don't have success, I come back. The success in Berlin was immediate. Then he went to France, Italy, Spain. He also went to England and Switzerland. What they say is that already you were great and you were playing the way nobody else was playing in Europe at the time. Well, that's exaggerated. Is it? Yeah. There were lots of good pianists in that time. But not with that. No, Rachmaninoff was a fantastic piano player. He said you played his second sonata better than he. Third concerto, yeah. yeah that's true. <laughs> <laughs> he said, in fact, Rachmaninoff said, he never knew the possibilities of the piano until he heard you play. Yeah, he liked my playing game.
he told Steinway that the only person he wanted to meet in America was Rachmaninoff, because he never met him in Russia. And I remember that when I married Volodya, we came here in 1934, beginning of 34, the first person that he, that he took me to was Rachmaninoff. And we hit it off, as we say. Akman liked me and I adored him, naturally. Oh, that was very deep friendship, very deep. I was like his son, you know. When he got to America, he had immediate success. I think I got my musical influence with the contact with great artists. First of all, my mother, in the beginning. Then all the artists I knew. Then my friendship with Rachmaninov and her father, later. My father came back to Milano and told us about the program. And they told me there is a, a pianist, Vladimir Horowitz. Oh, I said, so he said, what's the matter with you? Because I already heard him, you see. This was 1933. I heard him in 32 and 33. So that's when father met Volodya. My father always had his solids go to his house. So he told the manager, Mr. Hall should be at the Hotel Astor at certain hours. So I was so nervous that father didn't, wouldn't like him that I went out. And Mr. Horowitz had been scared to death by everybody, saying, like, uh, father would be an ogre, said, be punctual, otherwise he will kick you out. So he said to me that 10 minutes before three or four, he was going around the Hotel Astor to be uh, ready. And when we rehearsed a little bit, and he was very pleased. And that I, uh, uh, I, met, I met him and play. And after that, I met my wife. Then I play Brahms with him and many other things. Then after that, we were, he was my father-in-law, you know. <laughs> I didn't know even that she, he had some children. And a musical background. She came to the rehearsal. She fell in love with me. We were just married, early 1934, and it was published in Vanity Fair. In this picture, it's me with my father. You can see that the profiles are very similar. And that's where the similarity ends. He got the talent, and I only got the profile. This is a picture of my daughter Sonia with my father. You see the smile on his face looking at her. She was the one he liked mostly. And I think he said once to my mother, very gently, that he never loved his children as much as Sonia, which was one side flattering, one side not so flattering. I'm exactly like my mother in temperament, a very patient woman. You can never express your own personality. You have to subdue your personality to them. But that was I chose. No, nobody forced me. Well, first of all, nobody forced me to be the daughter of my father. <laughs> Just happened, and nobody forced me to get married to a, a famous uh, artist. Sonia was our only child. She was the granddaughter and the daughter of two personalities. It was even more difficult for her. That is the self-portrait she painted before she died.
You know why I listen from Sears? Because when you don't see the artist, you have the real, you hear the real conception of the interpretation, and you're not um, swayed or impressed by the personality of the artist. In this room, I only hear the sound, and I don't look at him. I don't see him. So I'm not under the spell, that magic spell. Like most artists, he had depression. There was a time when he had, I call it nurse breakdown, call it colitis, call it whatever it is, and that was 12 years. That was a long time. In the 12 years that he didn't play? Yeah. In the 12 years yeah. from 1953 to 65? Well, I was in this room very happy. You were in this room very happy. Very happy. <laughs> and you, madame? Not so happy. But you stayed here. Oh, yes, I did. It must have been a difficult 12 years for you. Yeah, because, you see, from time to time you would say, I will never play again. I said, fine, very fine. And my heart was sinking to my feet. But I would say, fine, fine. But if the you only don't want thing to play. I was doing the records, as I told you before. Yes, you keep saying you were doing the records. But the that... fact is, you did not face the public for 12 years. Yeah. Yes, it's impossible. And on one occasion, I'm told, you didn't leave the house for two years, and you almost never left his side. I remember once he was playing canasta with me and Milstein. And Mills said, you know, I played in Oklahoma, and they said that you were in an insane house. And I said, what do you mean? I played with Horowitz uh, the other day, Canasta. He's fine. You see, there were always uh, rumors. But how did the rumors start? 
You see, the America likes bad news. They don't like good news. <laughs> the headlines are always bad news. You sell the paper. <laughs> If it's a good news, you don't sell the paper. For the first year, I don't think that he came down from his room and uh, he didn't play. Then he started to play. And then when it was about, uh, he didn't play from 53 to 65. When it was 56 or 57, he started to make records here at home with, uh, at that time, RCA. And then what pushed him to play a little bit, first of all, because he felt better and knew that he could play. But to reassure himself, he said, you know, I'm going to do a rehearsal in Carnegie Hall. You remember when they stood in line for 24 hours before the concert? There were people with mattresses. They stayed all night. That's why we got the idea to send them coffee and donuts. When we came out, there were still lines, and one young man said, Mr. Horowitz, I stood in line for 12 hours. And I turned around and I said, and I stood in line for 12 years. I don't remember why, but when I was in Milano, I went to, to a store that specialized in old music. And they had all the opus of Clementi, and I bought it. So, Volodya discovered it. I read a lot about Clementi and know that he's a very important teacher, very important connoisseur of the keyboard and composition too, but I didn't know that he's so prolific as a composer. And that I didn't know. Then when I started to study his composition and I read the biography of, of Beethoven and saw how Beethoven was influenced by his improvement of the keyboard itself, And the piano itself, because you see, the instrument inspires you to compose. You, you, instrument the inspire. instrument comes first. Sure. He used the piano in the time when, when uh, let's let take Mozart use, uh, I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the use of Mozart. This one use. This is Clementi. Beethoven was seven years old when that was written. Already. He used it uh, it's like a skeleton of what in future would c came by his greatest genius alive, you know. Mm -hmm. But he was the father of modern piano, the father of the pianism, and the father of the sonata form. Too. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. So that's why I'm so interested. If the player do not, that I don't have any interest in them, any percentage of his music or something. I just know it's good music. And so he got into Clementi, and then for and that moment it was only Clementi, yes. Scriabin, he thought also that was difficult for the public to get. That was, that's why he was reticent to play very much, but he played a lot of Scriabin. Scriabin 
was a mystic in the end of his life. And he, somehow in his fantasy, he thought that one day will come that the heat will destroy the world. He believed that, that he didn't know the atom could be even, even invented at that time. He, it was 1912 that was uh, uh, composed. And the piece, he, he, the name of the piece, the title is Ver la Flamme. Ver la Flamme is Toward the Flame. It's very modern, very percussive. It's very crazy. It's very difficult to take it. And this is very thrilling piece, and it's take difficult. Yes, I have to take the jacket, take jacket, yes. It is a difficult piece. It's very special. It's completely special music. It's a, it's a, a more percussive piano. This is a little frightening music. Be prepared for big sound. Okay. If I don't collapse, this is right. <laughs> Let's do it.
difficult. It's really, a, it's really a struggle of life and death. Yes, it is. This is difficult. He practiced two to three hours a day. He used to say, you practice 10 hours and then you practice on the stage. That's what he said. But what is amazing is that he didn't practice also the last years. When he made the records, there was a joke going on in the house. He would come down and play for 15 minutes. Then he'd say, you know, today I play 40 minutes. I said, no, I look at the watch. It was only 15 minutes. Sometimes, well, the most he, pr he practiced the last year was 40 minutes. But how could he get away with that? Well, he said, I practice all my life. Why do I need to practice now? It's not bad, you know, <laughs> for the old man. That was marvelous. For the old man, it's good. That's what I was thinking. Huh? I was <laughs> thinking exactly the same thing. That's a fantastic rhythm. Mm? It's a fantastic rhythm. Yeah, yeah. You have any spray? Oui. Oui. Now I can drink. What do you think? You married an angel and a devil mixed together there, Mrs. No, he married an angel. <laughs> and you and married a devil. I married a devil. <laughs> he married an angel. He I must tell devil. you that I have to have that, <clears throat> both of those qualities in me in order to project what the composer wanted. It has to be part of your nature. Part of my nature. And when you get older, you maybe lose the, the devil more and you become more angel. Vladimir Horowitz, considered by many the greatest pianist in the world, will be heard in concert in Moscow tomorrow. It's the first time he's played in his native land in 61 years. Charles Kuralt reports. The news that Horowitz is going to play a concert in Moscow has set the musical world right on its ear. Only one poster, in fact, outside the box office was enough to make for a crush when the box office opened. 
And then I spent all the night here because I wanted to get the ticket by all means, but afraid to miss it. From my childhood, it was my dream to hear Gorbis. And now my dream will come true. Before I die, I want to see the country where I am born, so that uh, I cannot wait anymore. And maybe next year I will not play anymore, I don't know. Going back to Russia was the high point of his career. We went to Skriabin house, where he saw Skriabin daughter, and he played on Skriabin piano, and that was a wonderful event. So he went back before he died to his favorite places. What? What do you think of the acoustics? Very good. Uh, is it as bright as you remember it's it? It's bright. Very uh, loud, huh? Yeah, it's loud. I admire him that time because to come out on the stage after 61 years, it's not so easy. But once he put the foot on the stage, nothing else existed. It was only the piano.
I saw him sitting in the chair with still eyes, and boom, and then on the floor, flat on the floor. So I went there right away and said, Miss Nile, Miss Hall is dead. But the thing that is interesting that I didn't get rid of the chair. You know, somebody would think, get the real chair. No, I sit every day in the chair. What kept us together was the music and his piano his concerts. Well, I liked him also like a person, as a person. <laughs> but I mean, the bound, the bound, say, was the music. <laughs> 